Frank Ling. And I'm Charles Lee. And you're listening to the Grok Science Show. That's right. It's a weekly look at the world of science, technology, and their effects on our daily lives. Coming up on today's program, George Zidon will join us to discuss ingredients. So stay tuned for all of this. Plus the Grokatron 5000. And our world famous question a week. Coming right up. Here. On the Grok's Science Show. Science show. Well, all around us, we're surrounded by processed goods and foods that we use routinely, but how much do we know about the chemicals that are in them? Well, joining us today to discuss this issue is Mr. George Sidon. Mr. Sidon is a science communicator, television and web host, and producer. He created National Geographic's web series Ingredients and co wrote and directed MIT's web series Science Out Loud. His work has been featured in numerous sources, including the New York Times and Forbes, and he's currently the executive producer at the American Chemical Society. He has penned the new book, Ingredients, The Strange Chemistry of What We Put in Us and On Us. And Mr. Zainan, thank you very much for joining us today on the Grok Science Show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, there's certainly a fascinating book you've written here, Ingredients. Talk about the chemistry of everyday life. I'm curious why you decided to write the book. So a couple of uh, years ago, I, I did a show for National Geographic in which I tried to make consumer products, things that you'd recognize like lipstick or hand sanitizer, from quote unquote all natural ingredients. And sometimes, you know, they worked pretty well. Turns out you can actually make a decent lipstick from a few different types of oil and rust. Um, But most of the time, they did not work very well. Uh, I could not, for the life of me, make a hand sanitizer that sort of gelled up in the same way that commercial hand sanitizers do. And that sort of got me thinking, like, is natural stuff better for you? And conversely, is processed stuff bad for you? And and I thought it would be, uh, frankly, I thought it'd be like kind of a simple answer. And uh, but but it wasn't. And that sort of got me down the path of, of writing this book. Is there such a fine line between the two? A lot of the processed materials that are out there derive a little bit from some natural substances. Sometimes you have a mix of the two. Absolutely. I mean, one of the first things that I discovered that I was surprised by is just how long humanity has been processing stuff. You know, we we think of processed food as really new, like a a Twizzler or an Oreo or something that that was invented in the last century or so. But humanity has been taking stuff from nature and adapting it to suit our needs, specifically with food, for thousands of years. I, I came across a group of people who live in the Andes who basically freeze dry potatoes using a process that involves just a flowing stream and the the temperature of the place that they live, you know, have have been doing that for thousands of years. And freeze drying is something you think like, oh, this is something that NASA invented in order to send ice cream into space. But no, people have been doing it for much longer. So, you know, to answer your question, is there a fine line between processed and unprocessed or is there a distinct line? Not really. I mean, everything that you're, everything that you see in the grocery store has been processed in some way. It's a, it's a gradient. Some of it has been fairly lightly processed. Some of it has been more heavily processed, but trying to categorize foods by the the extent of the amount that they've been processed is, is fairly tricky, actually. How much do you think people think about this? Certainly there are efforts to sell products based on how much they're processed. So there is a difference. If you, if you go by what a group of scientists out of Brazil have been saying for the, the past few years, they've sort of come up with their own classification system to, to sort of rank foods based on how much they've been processed. And according to them, what you want to avoid are what are called the ultra processed foods. So this is something that, you know, what, what you think of when you think of processed food, like a bag of Cheetos or a box of Oreos or um, things like that. Um, what they're saying is like, okay, we've, you know, we've categorized, we've, we've lumped these foods by the, by the method of their production. So are there a lot of additives? Um, are there a lot of uh, manufacturing steps? Are there emulsifiers, that, that kind of thing? And you want to sort of avoid those foods. And then there's, there's another group of people, a scientist, who would say, 
Well, it, it's actually not so much about what you do to a food that determines whether it's good for you or bad for you or neutral for you, but it's more about what's actually in the food. And that's something that's actively under debate these days. So you know, should you watch out? Like what you, should you watch out for? I would say when it comes to food, um, you, you want to make sure that you're getting the sort of macro and micronutrients that you need. You don't want to be deficient in, in anything. But after that, I wouldn't worry so much about really, really specific granular things like, like kind of the kind of stuff you see in health magazines, like make sure to drink light roast coffee because it's high in antioxidants or whatever it is. That sort of stuff, I would just, I would focus on something else. How much do we know about all the additives that go into some of the foods? So I think for the day to day, if you're just a consumer and you're wandering through the grocery store, I would not think about it all that much. There are a, there's a group of scientists who spent their their whole their whole job is basically to figure out are these additives safe um, and are they likely to cause let's say cancer or some other disease. Um, and I would say like we're in pretty good hands when it comes to that front. I know there are lots of people who would disagree with that, but um, from what you know from the the research I've I've seen. It, it, it takes, you know, it takes, uh, there's a fairly ha- high sort of uh, standard when it comes to um, figuring out, is this thing going to gonna cause cancer? Um, and there are people who, who, who look at all the available evidence from things you probably heard about, like animal studies, all the way through to um, human cell line studies, through to studies with actual humans involved. You know, and, and so there are people who synthesize all that evidence and come out with a recommendation at the end. I would say if you're a consumer, you know, pay attention to those recommendations a little bit, but I wouldn't, you know, get into the weeds of the evidence itself because you're likely to follow a thread and be led astray. So not limited to just foods. I mean, there are all these other items that we use routinely and maybe don't think too much about what chemicals go in them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I spend a chapter in the book talking about sunscreen. That's a really interesting one because it's it's also one of those things that, it, you know, there are, there are nuances and it's, it's important to understand what those nuances are. The sun is a, is a really powerful, uh, uh, really, really powerful uh, uh, fusion reaction. I'm not a physicist, I can't say for sure, but there's a ton of energy coming, you know, being shot at the earth from the sun. So, you know, do I, do I sunbathe? No, I don't, because I, I, don't, I don't think that's, a, it's a great idea to, to, to spend hours and hours and hours absorbing all that, that UV light. By contrast, do I, am I like terrified of the sun and afraid to go outside? No, I think, you know, we as a species have been around for a long, long time and the sun's been around for a long, long time. And, uh, and we've adapted to, to sort of figure out what amount of sun is okay and uh, make sure that we get less than that amount. And, and you can apply this to pretty much everything in your life. One of the things that's actually really very clear when it comes to the science is smoking. That's the, the one case that in the book where I, where I looked at the, all the evidence and it was, I mean, just shockingly clear in every respect that that smoking is bad for you and exactly how bad it is for you. There have been decades of evidence of that and the, the, there's really, really good solid science on, on that front. And, and yet, you know, 30 million Americans still smoke. You know, the new trend is vaping. What do we know about that? Yeah, so uh, vaping is a lot newer than smoking, obviously. Um, and so the science is, is less clear on that front. Based on the early studies, and I'm assuming here that, by the way, we, we've had the, before the COVID pandemic, um, we did have in the U.S. The, that very, very sharp increase in vaping-associated um, uh, lung uh, um, uh, distress and injuries. So if you, if you set that aside for just a moment and you look at the studies on sort of long-term uh, or semi-long-term vaping, it seems like uh, vaping is somewhere in between being neutral for you and being bad for you. Certainly, uh, probably not as bad for you as smoking, but also probably not great for you to be regularly inhaling aerosols into your lungs like that. But, but we don't fully know yet. We don't fully know yet, and it'll take a, a while before we really do illnesses that were happening recently in the U.S. I spoke to a few different scientists about that, and their suspicion was that that was actually caused by a chemical contaminant rather than something sort of inherent about the vaping product itself, just because of the incredibly sharp increase uh, and how fast those, you know, those illnesses happened. 
Well, the book goes through a lot of different topics, uh, some uh, a little less more humorous in a way. You talk about aphid excretions. Yep. Yeah. The aphid is a really incredible insect. So the way it feeds is it will actually, uh, it has gotten sort of a long, flexible needle at the end of its face, and it will stick that needle into plants and worm its way all the way down to the, the part of the plant that carries the sap. Uh, and, and it will then, once it's sort of like hooked into the, to the plant, it'll just sit there and um, chug on this sap for days and days and days. And of course, that means that it will um, excrete out that sap for days and days and days. And so what comes, what comes out of an aphid's butt is actually not all that different than the sap that goes into its mouth. It's a, it's a, a, a sweet sort of syrupy liquid. And, um, you know, if, if, an aphid, if an aphid infestation gets really, really bad, you can have a, a billion aphids in, a, in, a, in an area. Um, and so there were Native American tribes in, in California that would come across these reeds covered in dried aphid syrup. And they would, they would harvest that and they would um, make those into essentially candy. That's another example of just the crazy things we've, we've done as a species to process uh, stuff out of nature and, and turn it into, into food. In this case, I'm sure it, you know, it was delicious. I covered a lot of very interesting topics. I'm curious, were any of these particularly surprising to you when you came across it or one that you thought, oh boy, I really have to share this? <laughs> yeah, um, so there's a lot of like little anecdotes and stuff. One of the best things about the scientific literature is reading um, medical, medical case reports. And one in particular stood out to me in about 2011, uh, there was a, a, a kid who, who, a five-year-old who came in and presented with a series of symptoms that made doctors unfortunately suspect leukemia. But when they did a, um, uh, uh, a biopsy, um, what they actually found that the patient's bone marrow was turning kind of jelly-like, and that, that is not really associated with leukemia. So they did a little bit more of a digging on the patient's history, and they discovered that over the past three years, he had only eaten pancakes, chicken nuggets, tapioca pudding, French fries, animal crackers, vanilla pudding, and wheat pretzels. Now, if anything about that list strikes you, is that there's not a lot of vitamin C in it. And so it turns out what the kid had was scurvy, which is an illness that you think of as being the sort of sailor's illness back in the 18th century or, and earlier. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, that was just an, an incredible medical case report. And it's, it's things like that that just pop out of the literature and, and grab you. That Those were the most surprising. <laughs> Sounds like my four-year-old's diet. <laughs> well, as I said, this is a really a great collection. I think people will find it intriguing. I'm curious, do you think people have become more aware of the ingredients that are in the, the stuff that's around them? You know, I think over the past probably 10 or 15 years, um, there's been a, a lot more emphasis, especially on the internet, um, about, you know, watch out for this chemical, it's bad for you, or, or this chemical has been shown to do this particular thing in my, or, and there's, and, you know, in my opinion, a lot of that is just, is unnecessary fear mongering. It's like latching on to one particular result uh, in one study. So a lot of the times it wasn't done in humans, and then sort of just expanding that out of all proportion. Um, so I, I hope what, you know, my hope for a, a, what someone might take away from the book is a better understanding of how scientists find out what the truth is and, and how, uh, how they decide what's reliable and what's not so reliable. And then if people would, can apply that to their own lives, that would, be, that would be really an amazing thing. We were talking with Mr. George Zaidan. He's the author of the new book, Ingredients, The Strange Chemistry of What We Put in.